And what I mentioned was the theorem says is that actually this protocol can be made secure up to basically uh, as close as you want up to 50% uh, uh, corruption. Uh, as long as you set the parameters correctly in this protocol. And what we meant by setting the parameters correctly was that the mining difficulty needs to be very tightly calibrated to the network delay. <coughs> uh, in particular, what we needed was that the block time, the time it takes to find a block, needs to be significantly bigger than the network delay. By a lot bigger, roughly, if you wanted to get close to uh, 59, 50%, uh, uh, you would need it to be roughly 60 times uh, delta. And in fact, somewhat magically, this is actually what, uh, you know, how uh, Nakamoto uh, said it, this 10 minute uh, network delay, the no, 10 minute uh, uh, block time. Okay. So let me give some intuitions of uh, how we can have, uh, how we can prove these type of statements. Okay. So a little bit more formally, the appropriate set, then we have a, a clean mathematical expression of what it means for, uh, to set these parameters correctly. And this is what the formula is. I'm not going to prove this exact formula, but I'll give you some intuitions of why this kind of uh, makes sense. So let alpha be the mining rate of honest players. So mining rate means this, uh, uh, how fast do honest players uh, find blocks. Okay? And beta is the mining rate of the adversary. If the attacker only con controls 50, then alpha equals beta. They're uh, mining at the same rate. Right? They're finding blocks at the same, uh, same rate. So ideally, we like to say this is secure when alpha is greater than beta. Good guys find things faster than, uh, than bad guys. But as I mentioned, there is an attack, and it needs to somehow depend on, uh, on delta. Uh, so here, the, the condition is that alpha time this, times this thing that depends on, uh, on delta should be greater than beta. So I need to actually, uh, the good guys need to have a bigger majority. Uh, but how big it is, how much more I need, uh, decreases once the mining rate goes down. Because this mining rate, alpha, gets multiplied by delta. So if I'm finding things much, much smaller than delta, then this alpha times delta becomes very close to, uh, to zero. And then I'm getting closer to uh, just the condition alpha, equals, uh, alpha greater than beta. Okay. So to give some intuition of why things need to depend on delta, uh, there is actually a, a pretty good attack. And this is the attack from Decker Watoffer. So what they realize is whenever a good guy mines something, right? you mine a block. Me as the attacker, I control the network. If I control the network, I see this block first. Like you are just a single person. You're alone. There's lots of other good guys out there. You, you're not going to just fight that you found this block. That is not going to help you a lot because you're just uh, tiny. But me as attacker, I see this first. And I'm not going to give it to everybody else. I wait. How long do I wait? Well, as long as I can. So I take it. I'm delaying it for delta steps. And during these delta steps, what do I do? I'm going to be mining on this thing. Okay. So now the attacker actually gets some kind of advantage. Every time a good block is mined, he gets delta three times steps of, uh, of mining. Intuitively. Right? So uh, very, very high level, you would kind of think that if the block time is like C times delta, so uh, blocks are done much, uh, are, uh, arrive much slower than delta, then the advantage you get is just 1 over C. So it goes down. So that's very, very high level. OK? This is not a proof at all. Right? OK, so uh, let me at least give a high level overview of how we can prove some such a thing. And the first thing we should do is we have this complicated protocol. Well, it's not so complicated, but it's a protocol at random oracle. It's kind of, uh, it's a little bit messy. So the first thing to do is to get rid of this random oracle and to consider a nicer uh, kind of process. And the best way to actually do this is to use Ran Canetti's universal composability framework uh, and kind of try to, to find a nicer process uh, that models what's going on, that simplifies things. Okay? So what we're going to do is to define this idle functionality, which we call the F mine or F3, I think it's called in the paper, that, uh, that removes this messy protocol 
and instead just talks about some kind of like mining functionality. Okay, so in this mining functionality, we um, we have a tree. Okay, it's not really a chain, but we have this. Uh, we have a tree of a tree of blocks, and the attacker and the good guys at any given point they're going to say, "I would like to extend a particular uh, node here," and they can to try to mine from there, and with some probability p. So we go to P, I'm lucky, and I mine another block. OK? So it's kind of like, you know, like I had this picture, I want to uh, I want to analyze the protocol like that instead. Does it make sense what this F3 is? OK? And this is a it's kind of a messy proof, but it's like it's a no purely cryptographic proof that's relatively standard about random oracles to say the way the protocol behaves, it's just implementing this type of uh, extension functionality. So you have the functionality, F3, I go to it, the attacker goes to it, and it points to something with probability P, it's successful in mining, and in that case, it can extend it. Right? OK. So now we have this uh, clean kind of, uh, abstraction, and we know what the good guys are doing. They go. Every time they point to the longest chain in C, and they try to extend it. And the bad guy, he can at any given point point to anywhere he wants and try to extend it. Okay. It's still not easy to analyze the protocol in this, uh, in this type of model. Okay, because uh, I don't know where the attacker is pointing every time. So the key then, and I think this is a principle that applies already from the earlier works and, uh, and subsequent works, is to Instead of analyzing this complicated stochastic process that considers an attacker does whatever he wants, we, we're not very good at, at, at analyzing kind of these adversarial stochastic processes. We'd like to reduce it to analyzing some kind of just a basic stochastic process we understand. Just look at the good guys. And let's identify some uh, process regarding the good guys and some good property, uh, some good pattern that we would like to uh, occur. Okay. And this is what we do. We define something called a convergence opportunity that only looks at what good guys are doing. Okay. A convergence opportunity is going to be the following good pattern. The good guys are unsuccessful in mining for delta time. So none of the good guys. Good guys, we know what they're doing. Every time they just ask, mine, 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 right? For delta time steps, no success. Then a single guy, Muhammad, is lucky and he succeeds. Okay? Then delta time steps, nobody's lucky. Okay, this is a pattern. Okay, this is a pattern regarding good guys and regarding this <coughs> extension functionality. And we like to argue that this happens often. Okay, I'll discuss later on how to analyze this. And it turns out to not be so complicated. This is now a, a very simple. Uh, uh, markup chain, I'm like uh, asking this thing, I'm lucky with probability p. People are asking, asking, and now what's the probability? Or how often do I have something where I have silence for delta steps, then a single guy succeeds it, and then silence for delta steps. And how are you counting the time here? Uh, I'm counting uh, discrete time at every, uh, every time step. The, all the good guys make a call to this fmine functionality. And uh, some of them are successful, some are not. So the time is maintained by F mine. So yeah, the time is by F mine. I'm like every time step I ask F mine. Sorry. Every time step is a query to. Every time is a query to F mine. Yeah. And uh, uh, now, uh, as you can see, all of this converge opportunity for this to to happen, I need the difficulty to be set so that. We have like silence with delta step. I need to make sure that the block time is uh, is longer than delta. Otherwise, this will ever happen, never happen, right? So many difficulties need to be done so that they actually do get the silence for delta steps. So, uh, so if the blockchain is long, uh, then it happens. Uh, why the block it will always happen with positive probability. Yes, but I, uh, it will always happen. Great point. But I want it to happen often. Okay. So it's gonna. It's gonna. Uh, I want it to happen sufficiently often. With high enough probability? With high probability, I want it to happen often, yeah. In fact, what I would like to say is that this converge opportunity, uh, this happens 
uh, happen often in any big interval. So in any large period of time, I need to have many converged opportunities. How many? What we'd like to make sure is that this happens more often than a bad guy finds new blocks. Okay? So by set, I want to set the parameters so that I will get more converged opportunity, more of this like nice pattern, than the, uh, the number of uh, successful queries that hacker has to the f mine functionality. Right? So checking how many successful queries he has to f mine, that's very easy. So now I just need to argue that I have many good converged opportunities. So right now, what I'll try to... Sorry? We just don't want the, the good guys to interfere with each other. That's all that you know. That's, that's all I that want. You no, I, this thing, yes. This converge opportunity kind of uh, make sure the good guys are not interfering with one another. Uh, and also it will prevent uh, bad guys from uh, interfering with the good guys. So let me, like, I will in the next few slides kind of sketch how these two properties give you what you want and then sketch how to get this, yeah? I still don't understand what a convergence opportunity. So it's silent for delta, then a single guy mines, and what happens? And then silence for delta again. Now what does it mean that a single guy mines? OK, so uh, remember, we, uh, the way I discussed this f mine is that uh, I've now reduced the problem to uh, having the, all the players at any time step with discrete time. What they do is they go to this idle functionality, and they point to some mm, somewhere in this uh, thing, and they say, please mine. And this functionality says with probability p, you're lucky. And then you're allowed to extend this branch. So, this so he's successful with probability p then? So yes, uh, each node is successful with some probability p, okay. but there are many of them, right? Okay. So it could be that <coughs> this particular time stamp, both you and I manage to mine. And that would be annoying, because then we interfere with one another. I see. So you, you, by a single guy, you mean one succeeds and all the rest fail? Fail, yes. Okay. So I want silence, 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 silence for 100 steps. Then only you win, yeah. you success, and then silence again. Yeah, and nobody else does. And nobody else does, yeah. The attacker could do. I don't care about the attacker. This is only counting good guys. And you're only looking for one of these, like delta? No, I want to make sure that, in fact, I want to make sure these converge opportunities grow faster than the number of successful uh, uh, minings that the, uh, that the bad guy does. So by, again, you mean that it goes? No, I just mean that, like, this is what, like, I just mean silence. Like convergence opportunity is is like this silence delta. Then we have this is success. Uh, yeah success and then silence. And just keep so the length is a number of silence successes you have. Uh, this is like a single convergence opportunity. Yeah. Okay. And if you want a longer one, then then I need to like have another one happening afterwards. So um, for for instance, like. This would be now, if I had like this, then I have two of them. So two in a row. That's I could have two in a row, yeah. And then I, uh, then I can keep the same one, yes. Right. Yeah. Okay. But uh, yeah. But if this thing now becomes short, if there's another successful error, then it's gone. OK. OK. All right, so let's first argue a very simple thing. This thing is actually the, the whole proof. Why converge opportunities? If I've, uh, every time I have a converge opportunity, the chain grows for all the good guys. It's very, actually very easy to see. Why is that? Well, uh, it's actually, yeah, easy to see that whenever a converge opportunity happens, we have this silence. Okay. That means that. Uh, whenever, that means that when we get to this point, all the good guys have now seen whatever chain that was mined before. Okay. So whenever this guy now mines something, it's going to increase the chain by at least one from where it was before it started. Right? Well, after the second silence. Uh, after the second silence, yes. So now he increases it, but then we have another silence, and uh, you know uh, it gets propagated to everybody else at this point. So chain grows. Now the point is that the attacker maybe could potentially mess things up for us, but he doesn't really. The only thing an attacker can do is to make sure that, like he, he can, the only way he can mess things up is by sending something even longer, right? 
because otherwise they're going to ignore it. So in that case, it grows also. So every time you have a commercial opportunity, you know that whatever the chain was here, it actually will have increased by one because everybody, if somebody had some chain of a certain length, everybody will have that chain of that length when you come to here. Then a single guy wins, he's going to increase it. In fact, at this point, it doesn't really matter. It's single, it could be many. Uh, but it's going to increase for sure, and then at this point, everybody has increased. So chain grows. Good. So whenever we have a commercial opportunity, a chain grows. Now here's the more tricky argument, and I hope I'm not going to mess it up. The consistent one, this is going to be a sketch. The actual proof is more subtle, but it kind of should convey the idea uh, of why converged opportunities are good. So assume we have a converged opportunity for a certain length L. <coughs> OK? Now, the point here is that unless the attacker manages, so, so let's look at this is a converge opportunity for length L. So what I mean by for length L, this means that here he mined a chain of length L. So a single guy mines a chain of length L at this particular time. OK? What I claim is that unless the attacker manages to also mine a chain of this particular length, we know for sure that all good guys will agree on what this block is. And if they agree on this block, they agree on everything else because this is a chaining, because that's how the F3 uh, thing does things. Right? So if the attacker does not manage to mine something here, they have all agreed on what this is. So why is that? If you yeah. mine an alternative chain of length L, if, uh, if the attacker does not manage to mine a chain of length L, OK? Well, I'm simplifying things, OK? Uh, let's just say that he never mines something of chain of length L, OK? You're right that eventually he could always like, catch up, OK? But we'll get to that shortly. But for now, let's assume he never mines something of length L. If so, uh, all the good guys will agree on what this block is. <coughs> And the reason for that is that at this point, it was a single guy who, who won it, right? And since there is silence, when we get to this particular point, everybody has seen this thing. And therefore, the chain now is going to be of a length at least L. So good guys will never try to mine something of length L. Make sense? So uh, if we can just make sure that attacker doesn't mine something of length L, we're good. Now, this seems like a stupid thing because, of course, the attacker can always mine something like L, just it's going to take him some time, right? But the point here now is that actually, good guys, uh, they're not going to let him like, mine something of length L very much into the future because they are, at that point, they're much further down, so they're going to ignore whatever he sends that's, uh, that's from the past. So, really, in order for him to ruin this opportunity, he needs to mine something of length L within that, like, you know, before, after that point, but before they have reached this thing. Because otherwise, they're going to ignore it. So he doesn't really have much time to do it. So really, in order for him, me to argue that he does not manage to ruin this convergence, the only thing you need to argue is that in any sufficiently long interval, if he gets, like, just a little bit extra time, he still has less. Uh, blocks that he managed to mine, then a number of converged opportunities. I know this is kind of vague, and to give the actual proof is, uh, uh, takes a bit longer, but the point here is that for any sufficiently long period of time, I'm giving the attacker a slightly longer time, maybe a little here, a little bit there. If the number of mining, uh, successful miners that he has, is smaller than the number of converged opportunities. I know that every successful mining he has, he can only kill uh, at most one. So if the, he has less than I have, uh, there will be at least one where he does not manage to mine it within the time for them to accept it. Okay. So really, from this thing, uh, we conclude that the only thing we need to do is to make sure that uh, uh, the number of uh, successful minings he has uh, is smaller than the number of converged opportunities. So the only thing that remains is kind of to argue that these converged opportunities happen uh, commonly, right? 
that they're, uh, they're common. And in fact, I would like to get some kind of concentration binds on in any period of time, there should be sufficiently many of them. Okay. And uh, now, this really is actually just a very simple. Uh, uh, so you, you uh, this is actually a very simple uh, Markov chain, right? This is just, so you go and you have a probability of succeeding. And what's the probability of getting silence? Single silence, right? That's all you need to figure out. So now this is a simple Markov chain. And you should be able to just write down the Markov chain and analyze it. Uh, unfortunately, um, uh, we do know of concentration bounds from Markov chain. Uh, and uh, but they're kind of slightly less uh, well understood than Markov chains from the normal kind of concentration bounds. So one could just write it down and try to analyze it. Uh, we tried at first, but I'm not very familiar with this concentration bounds from Markov chain. So after trying a little bit, gave up on that and instead tried to uh, give a more combinatorial proof. And one can actually do that. Uh, it's instead of like, you know, if you're not smart enough, you have to try to be clever instead. And that's kind of what <laughs> uh, one can do. Uh, so there's actually a very simple uh, approach for uh, for bounding for getting a concentration bound on the number of uh, converged opportunities, and uh, the approach is is this. I can just tell it in a few steps. So first, you can use just normal channel point to say how many successful minings we have, right? How many times the good guys succeed? That's just normal channel point because we know every time independently with probability p. So that's very easy. Now, the question is, like, when do we have these periods of silence? To look at that, we can look at another random variable, which is distances between successful mines. Right? And I know that if this difficulty is set appropriately small, the distance between successful mines should be big, should be greater than delta. Right? So on average, the distance should be greater than delta. And if the average is greater than delta, I can use now concentration bounds again to say that the number of distances that are smaller than delta are small. OK, so I'll call that kind of like a, a bad event when between successful mines, the silence period is short. So every such bad event can kill two successful mines, right? Because if this silence is short here, then it can kill off this guy and kill off this guy. So every time this distance is between two successful mining is small, I kill off two things. And uh, that's the whole proof. Okay? And that's why when you look back to this formula, there was a factor 2 there somewhere. Coincidentally, this factor 2 should not be there. Okay? This is the whole reason uh, why uh, the, the, uh, we have this gap between the attack and the analysis. If one can remove that factor two, the analysis actually would be tight. Um, now, actually, subsequently, as I mentioned, uh, Abi and some uh, co-authors, some uh, Markov chain guys uh, from Northeastern decided to actually, like, the right thing to do is, come on, just analyze the Markov chain, which they did, uh, I think, both analytically and, ex uh, and experimentally, and indeed managed to get something tighter. But I don't think they have a, a clean, uh, uh, a simple expression. So at least, you know, this doing this kind of more stupid thing at least, at least gives you a simple expression that is uh, off by a factor two, maybe. Uh, but yeah. Do you use the fact that it's just geometric? It's, it's not just a model chain. It's a yeah, 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 definitely. This, uh, this does like some, yeah. But if you, you know, instead of doing that simple thing, you can try to analyze the actual market chain. All right, so uh, uh, let's kind of get back to where uh, the high level picture. The point here is we know that Nakamoto now, if you set the nine difficulty correctly, right, so that the block time is long, then the protocol is secure and uh, achieving consistency, chain quality, uh, and, uh, and chain growth. And there is also this attack uh, uh, that we saw. And in fact, the attack says that if the mine difficulty is not set correctly, then the protocol is completely broken. So, in particular, what it says is that for every fixed instantiation of the protocol with some particular mining difficulty, if the network delay is longer, I can completely break it. Right? All right, so in more abstract terms, what we have concluded here is that in the random oracle model, 
under the assumption that the attacker controls, let's say, 0.49 or computational resources, but you can get any as close as you want to 0.5. We can get uh, a protocol that uh, satisfies synchronous state machine replication, right? Because the protocol parameters need to be uh, set as a function of delta, right? So this is actually kind of a, a subtle point because people often think, uh, look at Matt Nakamoto and say, look, this protocol is not parameterized by network delay, right? There's nothing there that talks about network delay. It doesn't have this classic uh, structure that we our standard protocols do where you say, wait for delta time, right? It doesn't do that. But actually, because of the mining difficulty, it needs to be set correctly, so it actually is a synchronous protocol also. Does it make sense, this point? Um, now, we also said this protocol is not secure in partially synchronous setting, right? We said that for any instantiation of mining difficulty, there is some network delay that breaks it, but maybe there's something else that exists, right? Maybe I could have a better protocol that's partially synchronous in this permissionless setting. Yeah? I have a question about uh, So earlier in the formula about setting parameters corrected, there was this quantity alpha. Yeah. Also, well, alpha was the mining rate of good guys. Yeah, what's the probability? Yeah. Beta and then also uh, delta. Yeah. Now, uh, let's say that we define all of those to be functions of time, so that mm -hmm. as the system uh, you know, unrolls, you know, people join or, or leave and the network changes, and so all of those are functions of time. So how do you understand the, the dynamics through this analysis? Like, is it per point? If at any moment in time that equation holds, then we're fine? Or are there like some material sort of a... Well, so yeah, you need that equation to hold... Uh, 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 so the analysis assumes it's hold all throughout. Uh, you can probably if this if this doesn't hold for a short period of time, you usually cannot do too much uh, damage. But uh, like I, I don't think it's enough to say it holds on average. But so probably. It holds point the, uh, the analysis assumes it does everywhere, right? But. Uh, uh, because that could be a rather dynamic setting. Yeah, 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 yeah. As long as this equation holds everywhere, yes. Yeah, so as long as the things are always uh, uh, set. Hiding the difficulty adjustment. So, OK, so uh, what I explained here didn't consider difficult adjustments. There are papers uh, doing it with difficult adjustments also. It becomes more messy. Uh, so you can do it with difficult adjustment also. As long as at any given point the, the condition holds. You need certain other things also. You need actually, let me not go into it. It's a little bit more messy. All right. So. Uh, you just said that it would be broken if like, the amount of mining will change such that the delay parameter. If the, yeah, yes. Then it definitely, yes. Yeah, yeah. If the amount of mining changes, so the delay is then it does broken. Yeah. OK. So uh, leaves the question. So this is in a synchronous setting. Leaves the question what you can do in a partially synchronous setting. Can you actually get something? Turns out. It's not just that you have an attack on this particular protocol. Uh, it's impossible to get any type of partially synchronous protocol uh, as long as we, are, we don't know exactly how many players are there, even if you have proof of work. So even in this proof of work setting, if you have uncertainty about how many players are showing up, in particular, a two-factor approximation only, so if you don't know if it's going to be 50 or 100 people showing up, then you cannot get something that's partially synchronous. What do you mean showing up? Uh, How many people are there, right? As I said, in the normal, right, if the protocol gets as input only an approximation of how many people are there, that is that within a factor two, then you cannot get something that, is, uh, that works in the partially synchronous setting. A factor, a factor of two is? When you say majority, you say factor half. I mean, the, the, the no, this is not uh, honesty, right? This is not uh, what uh, the number of honest players. This is say even if the attacker only has like a tiny, tiny fraction of, of computational resources, right? Attack is very, very weak. If players are not aware of how many other players are out there, yeah, within a factor two, you, can, you cause network problems. Sure, exactly. This is trivial. This is a trivial impossible. 
is a network partition. Yeah, exactly. So this is actually a trivial uh, lower bound, but it's, uh, note that this is changes things from the, uh, in the permission setting, you clearly can get things that are partially synchronous. So you also need a, a no. Yes. yes. You also need, need to know exact. Yes, 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 exactly. Right? So as I said, like, let's go back to our starting slide about what does permissionless mean. And now we've learned things. When you say are there, do you mean that, uh, and you don't mean they mind, you just mean that their uh, <coughs> is you take majority with their chain. That's what you mean, are there, right? What is the definition of this are there? Being there means that they're running a protocol. Like they need to mind? They need to mind, yeah. Okay, so okay, so I thought the definition of there is different. I thought, don't you get the same possibility result even if the definition of there is weaker, which says actually don't need to mind. All they, as long as they broadcast a chain and you take them when you enter, you take the majority. No, I don't know what that means. Let's take them. I'm, right now, I'm just saying if any kind of protocol uh, that is not aware of the exact number of players but, but you know, cannot be partially synchronous. We even with proof of work. It's not clear how you define a player being there or not. I don't understand the definition. So, for example, if I don't mind, yeah. I don't do the mining, but I'm there. Mm -hmm. I'm there, namely, you know, I post uh, my, my chain. I'm there. Am I there or not there? I don't mind. I'm, I'm busy. Then you're not there. If you're not following the protocol, honestly, you're not there. So, can you rephrase this as saying that that's the uh, I'll maybe get in total number of, of CPU power in the system? You can say that CPU, you can also do this uh, without proof of work. This is something that makes, I'll, I'll, if I, in fact, I'll discuss it more. I'll get back to this point in much more detail. Like the point I'd like to make here is that right now, here are the conclusions of what we know about the permissionless model, okay? So in the permission setting, we knew exactly how many people are there and who they are. In the permissionless, we said we don't want to know how many people are actually showing up. And the point here is that that forces us to work in a synchronous model. In a partially synchronous model, we cannot do it if we don't have full awareness of how many there are. Okay? Number two, this other very simple observation is that if you want to deal with people that join late, you cannot get uh, n minus one. This is something that was discussed already uh, earlier. Uh, you need to have a assume an honest majority. Okay? Dollar strong doesn't work if you want to deal with people that show up late. Again, a very, very simple uh, impossibility by just doing this kind of, uh, you show up, uh, these guys say one thing, these guys say one thing, I don't know who to trust. Right? So you need to, to deal with late joining, you need to assume honest majority. So late joining is clients? Sorry? Late joining is the same as clients? The same as clients, yeah. Because the client wasn't there, he joins late, and he's like, well, who should I trust? And then finally, without authentication mechanism, you need proof of work. So the conclusion here is, actually, Nakamoto is pretty great. The fact that it was synchronous seemed like a deficiency, but no, it's needed. And Nakamoto, indeed, under these assumptions, he satisfies it, and these assumptions are needed. So if you want fully permissionless, fully, fully permissionless uh, consensus, you need to have a synchronous model communication. Right? Your, parameters need to be, your protocol needs to be parameterized by, by delta. You can only get honest majority, and you need proof of work. Okay. So, so with like proof of stake and so on, that would look different, or what? Well, I mean, it's cannot right? It will not satisfy permissionless because there are impossibility results. Okay. So, so what, what do you mean by need proof of work? What I need proof of work is that you were not here when I presented impossibility results from our paper run. You know, the first one was, <laughs> but there is an impossibility result. The first one was, <laughs> in, without authentication, you can always split uh, people into the two things, and you can never hope to get consistency. No, but, but, but you may change no, the model okay. in a different way. Not, proof of yeah. work is one way to change the model, but there may be other ways to change the model. Exactly. It's not that you need proof of work. You may need something. You, I mean, you need to make sure that this type of like simulation is costly that we did, yeah, right? Yeah, but proof of stake. In the plain model, it doesn't work. Yeah, exactly. In the plain model, it doesn't work. Yes. You need, no, the point is, you, without authentication mechanism, you model. need to have something where simulation is costly. Yes. Okay? So it is. So maybe the implication so should be in costly simulation. simulation. No, it needs costly simulation, yes. You, uh, I'm not sure. No, you need something where the simulation uh, is costly. Okay? Yeah. Let me just mention this, like uh, the proof of stake thing. 
proof of stake thing, I will discuss it uh, in more detail uh, a little bit later on. But there, you actually give up on this thing. You give up on this anyone can join property. And you say that you have only the people that have some kind of public keys are allowed to join. But, but right? so, this so, is but, not, it's not open. It's not permissionless anymore. It's only the people who have staked that are allowed to join. But proof of work is in some sense just like, uh, I mean, you also need to spend resources. You also need to look specific, in, but anybody, in, in, okay, so. Uh, in terms of, it just translate, it, like proof of stake is just a much more direct way to. No, I, I, I claim that it's actually very different. Okay, so let's let's look at uh, uh, any type of uh, this type of proof of stake mechanism, where it's only the people that you have some kind of PKI. It's only the stakeholders that can uh, uh, participate. If all those stakeholders collude, right, for whatever reason they collude and they say, you know what, today we got to decide that interest uh, the transaction fees are going up to a uh, dollar per transaction. Okay. There is nobody who can prevent them from doing that. Well, the but, fact that but, you have something that's truly permissionless, one second, means that anybody can join, means that actually whenever this happens, other people can start to join in the system. And Jacob has this very nice paper showing that in that case, uh, there's nobody who can hold the, the system uh, hostage because other people will enter the system and bring down the, uh, the fees. Right, so really, it's very, very important that you have this totally free entry. Now, right, this obviously comes with a cost to do this type of proof work. But uh, if you want to have this totally free entry, you need to have a mechanism that ensure that uh, you cannot do this, uh, that simulation is costly. But, but the simulation, uh, I mean, uh, for example, uh, can it still be done if, because uh, you know, you, you're adding these parties, but the, the stake is only in the hands of the two honest parties. Can you still do the simulation? Uh, in a sort of proof. As I said, like, uh, any type of proof of stake is some a setting where you assume that there exists some kind of uh, authentication mechanism. You assume a PKI infrastructure. Right? That means it's only those people that have the public keys that can participate. The system is close to those guys, and it means that those guys can hold the system hostage if they want to. Right? Now, maybe it's hard to get everybody who has stake to, to collude, but uh, you know, in this world, isn't it that like one percent controls ninety-nine percent of the resources or whatever the numbers are? So in that case, one percent of the richest people could con could hold ninety-nine percent hostage if you wanted to. They do. <laughs> they do. <laughs> they do. Yeah. But so so it really, if you want to be fully permissionless, you need to prevent this kind of cost simulation, and uh, so, yeah. So again, I mean, the way I think about it, there's uh, you need scarcity, and yeah, exactly. you can define. Uh, for example, take all the CPUs in the whole world. That's your total CPU. Yeah. They no, uh, can join, right? So uh, you can say you use scarcity using CPUs or scarcity using a PKI that sets up scarcity. You need some scarce resource. Sure, but, but PKI is authentication, right? So, so it's one example of, a, of generating scarcity by saying there's n people. No, no, yeah, to prevent the costly simulation, I agree. I'm just saying if you don't want any for type of. For your simulation, yeah. so you need scarcity of some resource. It could be CPU. Yeah. Could be some other resource. It's an abstract resource if you want scarcity. It doesn't have like it doesn't have to be a resource. You can say if you do simulation, we put you in prison. <clears throat> yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm and resources like a generation is costly for, for like you know if you assume that I have some magical government power that puts you in prison. Simulation is costly and it has nothing to do with um, scarcity. Well, I mean, basically, if you have infinite amount of this resource, yeah. then you then it's hard to argue about the power of the adversary. You need to somehow say. But the adversary is limited, it controls only one half. Yeah, he goes to prison if they simulate. What does that mean? Alright, let's continue uh, this discussion and I will, we can get back to, uh, I'll maybe like try to uh, run through the rest fast and get back to this philosophical discussion because I think this is the most interesting of what permissionless actually means, right? Uh, so uh, to maybe have a few minutes towards then to discuss uh, this, uh, uh, this thing. But um, the conclusion here is, you know, Nakamoto, under this assumption, achieves it, and uh, so that's very good. There's a lot of deficiencies with this protocol, uh, and I hope that in later workshops uh, there are improved uh, uh, methods for dealing uh, with uh, many of these deficiencies. As we said, it's slow. You can maybe improve this uh, uh, 60 delta to be better. We don't know. Right? The only thing we know is it needs to be a function of delta. That's what impossibility says. 
um, the throughput is low. There's a bunch of very nice works trying to improve the throughput. It's not completely free. They achieve slightly weaker security if you want to improve throughput. So it's still kind of a nice uh, open question. One thing we discussed was this fairness issue to incentive compatibility. The chain quality here isn't good. And I will maybe very briefly discuss uh, uh, why that is the case and uh, how it can be overcome. And uh, uh, the final thing is it does use this wasteful proof of works. And the question is, like, can we kind of circumvent it? And as I argued before, if you want to be in the fully uh, permissionless plain model, this seems to be the, uh, the way to go. But maybe you can relax something right, to get rid of it. So I'll discuss these two things uh, very shortly. So the first one is we have this. Why do you say uh, will the number of transactions, uh, transaction is, is different than block? You, you talk about block. I know, uh, let me not go. This is experimental numbers. right? This is in practice. It has few, few transactions in handles per second. Let me not go into it. it. There will be in future programs. Many people will discuss this thing. This is maybe the main uh, bottleneck in terms of scaling, like uh, how to scale uh, uh, Bitcoin. And uh, I won't have time to discuss that. There's lots and lots of nice, very nice works on that. All right. So here, to just this protocol is worse, of course, than classic protocols because it requires spending so much computational effort. Right? And why do people do it? Why would any sane person start mining? Well, there is a very good reason. The reason they do it is because they make money by doing it. And this was a genius in Nakamoto's protocol. He said, start doing all this mining. Why? Because whenever you mine a block, that's why it's called mining, it's gold, you actually get the Bitcoin, right? Which is pretty great, because you get a few of them, then you have a house. <laughs> right? So <laughs> uh, there's also transaction fees. But for now, let's ignore the transaction fees. Okay? And uh, so, so the problem with this with the fact that whenever you mine a block, you get rewards, is that you actually really need to have a blockchain now that has good chain quality. Because otherwise, uh, an attacker can spend as much resources on you and get potentially twice as much money, then nobody is going to be an idiot and do the honest thing. They will just run the attack instead. So it's not incentive compatible. So once you start paying for people to do Something you need to make sure that it's actually worthwhile for them to do it. OK, there is some other issue about the variance of these rewards and the, the uh, mining pools and so on. I won't have time to discuss that. We'll just focus on this fairness issue. So ideally, what would we want? Ideally, what we want is that if I look at this chain, things are popping up. If I control a fraction <coughs> x of the resources, then I should get an x fraction of the blocks. Right? That's what I want. I control 30% of the computation resources in the world. I should get 30% of the rewards. Okay. Uh, so we cannot hope to do that, but we can maybe get you know, something close to it by the turn of point, right? So maybe control x, I should get 1 minus epsilon times x. And if I have that, that would be great, at least if I only consider uh, rewards. There is also some way of dealing with fees. Forget about it here. I don't have time. but. One way I can argue now is that actually, if I have something that is fair in this sense, that if I control a p fraction of the res f x fraction of resources, I get x fraction rewards, then it's incentive compatible. An attacker can never get more than it deserves. I want to run the protocol. Great. Now, does Nakamoto uh, uh, achieve it? Turns out, no. It's horrible. Okay, it's really, really horrible. Uh, in particular, an attacker that controls one half can get all the blocks. And if you control one third, you can get half of the rewards. Okay, so this seems bad, right? Uh, let's actually go over this example. It's really, really uh, cute and beautiful, uh, and it's actually intriguing. This um, so this is called a selfish mining. This was popularized by this beautiful paper by uh, Eyal and, uh, and Sirer. But actually, when you go back, it's in the Bitcoin forum in 2010. They already had this attack with very nice. Uh, it wasn't a form analysis, but they had a, a, a nice little Excel spreadsheet uh, showing how well the attack succeeds with a bunch of different parameters. And attack is uh, really uh, easy. So this is what you should do. Um, let's say a bunch of uh, we have a chain that's growing, blah, 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 blah. The attacker tries to mine something. Whenever he mines a block, 
He's like, I control the network. Why should I ever give it to anybody else? I just withhold it. OK? And I let the good guys do whatever they do. OK? So I withhold it. I let the good guys continue working. In the meantime, I, I try to maybe extend my thing also. But even forgetting about that, I just withhold it. Then I wait until the good guy comes along and he mines the block. What do I do then? Right? Ellie mines the block. What I do is I'm going to delay his block. And then I send my block to everybody else. How much so, in practice you can delay? Well, so this is, in fact, why on the Bitcoin forum in 2010, they had all this example, had these numbers and so on, and said this is really terrible. And then they said, well, but in practice, it's not so easy to delay things. So it's maybe not so relevant. But even if you don't delay, you just put it out at the same time, then you Yes, have you get a conflict. And in fact, that's, that's very nice that the paper by uh, Ayala and Sira indeed uh, analyzed what happens when you put it up. If you have a sort of successful build to winning, and you can, uh, yeah. So it, it's still. Exactly. And meanwhile, you can continue this thing, and so you can gain something there too. So even then, you can gain things, right? But even the simplest thing of like just withholding control the network, you only gain something. And let's see how much you gain by doing this thing. OK, let's assume the attacker controls one third. So over a period of time, over t steps, the good guys will have, on average, gotten two thirds t blocks. The bad guy will have gotten one third t blocks. But every time he gets something, he could kill off, in this example, one block for the good guy. He really killed it off. No? Because nobody's going to ever look at this thing. No, it's not clear. It is. Why? Maybe because I delay uh, Ellie's block, I delay it. Okay. And I give this thing to everybody. No, but this is assuming you delay. But you can't this delay. is not, I, uh, you know, this is not fair. This is adversarial model where attacker controls the network. OK? Ah, okay. I'm, you know, we are in the adversarial model. In the adversarial model, this is why we get the bound, you know, the, the bound Right? In the positive result, that's what we consider, this uh, very negative model, so therefore negative. So, uh, uh, so that's how many blocks uh, the, the good guys got. And the number of blocks in the chain is 230 uh, during this period of time. So therefore, the, the, go, uh, the, the, sorry, the, uh, the attacker got the, the, Yes, the attacker, the good guys get one half, the attacker gets one half. So by controlling one third of the resources, I get half of the blocks, very bad. OK, indeed, this requires you to control the network, which maybe is, you know, that's uh, the response to, I wouldn't call them practitioners, but to the Bitcoin people that own Bitcoin and so on, uh, why they're not very worried about this thing, because maybe it's very hard to actually perform this attacking practice. Um, and could you point which part of the pre uh, your previous proof fails? Uh, the the proof doesn't the fail. Cover. The proof doesn't fail. In fact, the proof gave you exact that number, if you remember. <laughs> right, that's the, the, the proof. <laughs> it's the proof, right? So that's why the, the, uh, in the previous thing, we had this bizarre expression, and that gave exactly this number. So it was tight. I think some people from ETH Zurich showed that, uh, that you could actually run these. Uh, yes, you can do it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and I think Vasilis will actually, I'm not going to spend much time on this thing because there's a whole uh, industry now trying to understand these type of attacks. And I think Vasilis will talk uh, much more about yeah. the selfish mining attacks. Yeah. So this is just to point out why chain quality kind of, it's important to look at this chain quality as a separate property uh, because it's needed in order to properly incentivize people. And uh, uh, there's a reason why the, bad, the bundle is bad because there is actually an attack at least in the adversarial model. Okay. Uh, there is a way that uh, we can get around it. I, in fact, don't have time really to go over it. Maybe Vasilis will talk about it later on. So we have this protocol that gives you kind of this approximate fairness, and it gives you absolute incentive compatibility. Let me skip uh, along. Uh, so the theorem is you can actually get something that's epsilon incentive compatible, where epsilon is 1 over poly. OK. <laughs> uh, this is still not satisfactory. You would like to get an epsilon where epsilon is negligible. We don't know how to do that. That's still an open problem. Uh, I know several people are working on it, but as far as I know, nobody has still managed to get something that actually uh, says that the uh, advantage by deviating is negligible. Because one over poly might still not be great, uh, good enough for practice, because if there, even if it's one over poly, why not do it, right? It's 
Suppose everybody does selfish mining. Then yes, no, some. yeah, then yeah. But still, you would like it would be great at least from a theoretical point of view to have something that's a Nash equilibrium, right? It's true that if everybody starts doing this, then it's not worth doing it. Uh, that's a problem, right? But uh, well, we know it's not a Nash equilibrium to follow the protocol at least, right? Suppose you, you change the protocol so the honest guys are supposed to do selfish mining. Yeah, it doesn't work. Yeah, no, you don't. Then nobody does anything. That's the problem, right? Then we should, everybody, like whenever you box, one guy does this. No, yeah. Then everybody's quiet. It's very. Uh, it's bad. Okay. Well, it's, it's very consistent. It's just not much liveness. Maybe <laughs> something, but the, the reason why we're discussing the approximate incentive compatibility is because there is a uh, limitation to exactly the same No, 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 this is an open problem. Not only, not only negligible, but just. Ah, yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Even the exact, we don't know. Yeah. Even that would be even better, yes, yes, yes. Okay, I'm just saying, even to get negligible would be great. Do you have a guess on whether I know. Yeah, we thought about it for a long time. It's just like very hard to analyze. <laughs> like, uh, yeah, but now we're in the permission. Yeah, and it, yeah, it's even then, I think it's it's like tricky, right, to deal with this. At least intuitively, it's the same. Even if you control the minority, there's a small probability that you get. Lucky, and you have more power than the honest people. So, it's Wait, but, so that's uh, the reason for saying that it's optimal. Uh, we don't know. Okay, very good open problem to get something that's fully incentive compatible, either fully or epsilon being negligible. Right now, the only thing we know is one over poly, uh, which is already better than uh, Nakamoto, which was basically not at all. One over over two. Yeah, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so let me get to this last point that uh, we wanted to discuss here of like, do we need to waste uh, energy? And this guy is tired, just like I am now. Uh, so he doesn't like to waste energy. So uh, let, let's go back to, to this thing. And we said, <coughs> if we have the permissions thing, we need all these three things. Maybe we can relax. Well, we said that with, if, without authentication, we need to have some kind of costly, uh, costly resources being uh, expanded in the protocol. So maybe let's just like give up on this thing and say that let's start off with a model where we have authentication. Okay. So this is actually, this is kind of like a proof of stake setting. We have some initial setup. We have some uh, authentication mechanism, or in fact, uh, I will assume a PKI. We can then say, okay, we give up on this thing. No authentication. But these other two properties are still useful. Uh, Andrew, what do, do protection, why do you say that uh, proof of stake requires authentication? Proof of stake requires a preset PKI. Why? That's why? what you have. No, no. Why do, why, do, why do the PKI have to be preset? Why can it be part integrated in a protocol? Uh, I mean, I, the way I understand proof of stake in any protocol that's out there, you start up by having some initial stake. There are public keys initially in the system. Yeah, no, no. If you don't have anything, impossibility holds. No, if you don't, if you start off with nothing, then you have the impossibility. Because the stake, I mean, the stake is associated to the public key, right? Yes, the stake are the public keys. So if you start off with nothing, no, the protocol needs to have common knowledge of what the initial public keys are. Uh, and that's how it is in all the protocols. And if your protocol doesn't have it, then apply the impossibility results from uh, the 2005 paper, from which you are co-author. <laughs> <laughs> so far, I remember, but that's <laughs> <laughs> okay. <clears throat> all right, so right now, I'm going to let go of this thing, and I'm going to assume that we have a, a, a PKI. As I said, in a proof of stake setting, for instance, we do have PKI because you typically assume that we have some pre-mined coins, they're called, but they're really just a public key infrastructure. The coins are different uh, keys. And now you can ask yourself, if we assume a public key, can we deal with the fact that people are coming and going? This uncertainty with number of players and late joining. Late joining is easy. That's uh, old stuff. But dealing with, uh, with uh, the fact that we don't know how many people are around is still an issue. Okay, and if you go back to all the protocols that Elaine showed in a classic setting, they really very strongly relied on the fact that uh, I do some something gets notarized if I get two third n signatures. I need to know what n is, right? Otherwise, I cannot check if I get two third n signatures. So all these kind of classic protocols very very strongly rely on the fact that you know exactly how many people are around. 
But it's not clear it's necessary, right? Maybe you can do better. Uh, so that's what we call the, the sleepy model, which is like the, the weaker version of permissionless setting, where I gave you authentication, I gave you a PKI. Okay? Okay? But I still would like to get robustness uh, in a setting where I don't know how many people are showing up. How about the uh, diffraction of uh, honest players? Okay, so I'm going to assume, make assumptions about the fraction of people uh, among the people that show up, I'm going to assume that 50% are honest. 50%. Yeah, and indeed it turns out uh, that's needed. Right? By this type of argument, you need to make sure among the people showing up, 50% need to be honest. So that's uh, necessary uh, and sufficient. And uh, it turns out that actually the approach is, is very easy. Uh, it's not as easy to analyze, but it follows similar uh, ideas to the analysis of Nakamoto. And the idea is actually, you know, can we kind of take Nakamoto and remove proof of work from it? Okay? And make use of the fact that we have a PKI, and that allows us to remove proof of work. Okay? So, the key insight here, uh, which I think was made in um, this Bitcoin NG paper by uh, Yellen Searer and uh, Robert van der is that what does proof of work do? in the setting, proof of work really just is a leader election mechanism. So we're electing some guy, and then he gets to package transaction to the next block. So maybe we can kind of, since we have this PKI, we can maybe use uh, some other mechanism for electing a leader. And the key idea would be maybe let's try to do the same type of mining that happens in Bitcoin, but say that every individual he only gets one guess per second. Okay? So if I make sure that I can only give you one guess per second, that's a way to kind of do this kind of mining that's not wasteful. Right? This is kind of vague, but we'll maybe see later on uh, very shortly uh, how to do it. Okay? So recall in Nakamoto's protocol, at every instance, we try to do this hashing to see if I'm going to be elected leader. And then I get to the package block. Now I'm going to replace it by the following puzzle uh, uh, checking mechanism. Your solution to the puzzle is going to be your name and a time step. Okay? That's the only thing you're allowed to check. And if you put in something that's not your name and a time step, that's an invalid solution for this particular time step. Okay? So at any given point, what you do is you're going to be mining, but every second you just do a single invocation to a hash function. And what do you put in? You put in Silvio's name if you're Silvio, and the current time, and you check if it's smaller than D. Okay? Um, and if you're elected leader, then you're going to take uh, whatever we did put into Nakamoto before, the previous, uh, uh, like the, the end of the chain, current chain, the new transactions, and the puzzle solution. And you sign it using your secret key. And this is what kind of makes sure that you, you're using this PKI now to say that you are actually the right person who won in this round. Right? So the idea is very, very simple. I'm just making sure that you're not al allowed to try any kind of uh, puzzle solution, because then you wouldn't be allowed to mine. But I'm saying at second 17, you can only try one solution, which is your name for 17. Does the protocol make sense? Now you can, like one important thing to point out here is that, note, we're doing something different here. We're putting in just the puzzle solution here. We're not putting in, before we put in transactions and the thing here. Why don't we do that? Because then you can grind. Then you can actually try a bunch of different transactions to see if you get elected leader more often. So that's why it's important here, in order to check whether you're a leader, I'm just putting your name and the time, and that decides whether you're the leader. <coughs> And then later on, we're using this, uh, uh, I'm authenticating the block that you're doing using your signature if you're the leader. Yeah? What's stopping you from uh, waiting for the time to change and choosing one of two? Okay, very good point here is like this, I need to make a little bit uh, extra restriction. Uh, it's not, not quite work, it uh, doesn't quite work. The important thing now is like uh, I'm not actually going to allow you to put in any time step. 
but in the blockchain, I'm going to require these time steps to be strictly increasing. So otherwise, the point is, yeah. The issue, of course, is that if I'm elected leader at time 17, maybe I'm going to use that thing at time 18 uh, also, right? Or maybe I'm going to be elected leader two years into the future. Maybe I can use it now. We don't allow it. We're requiring this uh, time sense to be strictly increasing, number one. And second of all, is whenever you send me something with a timestamp into the future, if it's, this is too far into the future, I say, no way, right? This is for tomorrow, not now. So the adversary is adaptive here? Okay. The adversary, uh, this protocol does not give you adaptive security, right? Because everybody can figure out exactly when you're going to be uh, the next leader. That is completely public. So if I, I can figure out that you're going to be the leader tomorrow, so I might want to corrupt you. Uh, and indeed, so this original thing just gives you, uh, gives you one half corruption in this model where I don't know how many people are around, actually. So this is the key thing, right? I don't know how many people are showing up. Right? There might be 100 people showing up or a million people showing up. As long as the majority of the people showing up are honest, it works. But it's only static corruption. You can get it to work with adaptive corruption using kind of v VRF style tricks also. But you, do, you don't need but to. What stops you from civil attack? Because I get lots of identities. So I generate tons of identities. Exactly. Right now, you cannot generate more identities because only the people that have a registered public key can do this, right? We start off assuming that we have a public key infrastructure. Go to the infrastructure and get lots of pairs of... Uh, <coughs> I, I, we assume that we have common knowledge on what the set of public keys are, right? We start off with common knowledge on what the set of public keys are. But you don't need to advance uh, to, to adjust D to the number of people that are really there, because otherwise you Okay, you, see, you can, if you want to do it more efficiently. Uh, if you don't do it, the protocol is just going to be a little bit slower. Okay, if only 10 people show up, we're going to confirm transactions at one tenth of the speed, but it's going to work. What? Oh, so your liveness depends. Liveness, here, liveness decreases. One could, we haven't done it, but we could probably do some kind of difficult adjustment also. But it's like already messy the way it is, but so. Uh, but probably one could do it also, yeah. So can you just use it, choose the hashes, just take the smallest one of the, all the active yeah. players is the one who wins? Uh, so the, 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 it's not so easy to get agreement on that, right? That's a great method if we have a broadcast channel, but we don't have a broadcast channel. So that's the, uh, yeah. So this is kind of a, like, yeah. OK, so we're kind of running out of time. Uh, so. I guess what I really want you to remember is like what it means for something to be a permissionless consensus, okay? And the features again to, to recall is that we're in a setting where nodes are not aware how many people are showing up, okay? People can join late and we have this free entry condition that anybody can join, right? That's what I would call the pure permissionless setting. Anybody should be allowed uh, to join. Okay. okay. Yeah. Where do you make money? Do you make money? <laughs> I make money. I, I don't make money ever. I never bought any bitcoins. <laughs> uh, I lost my bike. No. Sorry. Who oh, were in the? In this? Uh, so so this is a protocol where there is you don't need to have any mining rewards if you don't want to, because it's so cheap to run it, right? But if you want, you could give people mining rewards. <laughs> so this is like so this is now I'm working in a setting where I have a fixed like uh, there is a public key setting right so it's all of us are public keys but maybe some of us are participating others are not maybe uh, I would like in order to incentivize people to participate maybe I'll give them something to mine also but you know you don't have to maybe people uh, these are uh, not these things that's a transaction that was like what I'm put, what I'm signing here is the old uh, end of the chain, then the set, new set of transactions. That's a block, and the puzzle solution, which was just the number, right? Yeah. So the puzzle solution is just a time step in my name. So this really like consensus doesn't. You don't need to have these incentives here uh, at all. It's really it's just trying to uh, achieve consensus in a setting where I don't know how many people are actually showing up. I'm just relaxing that thing. 
uh, that we have uncertainty, maybe 10% show up, 100% show up, I don't know where, how many, and I want a consensus in that setting. But I have a, a public key infrastructure. And this public key infrastructure, if you're in a proof of stake setting, you, you get it automatically, as I said, because that's the coins. And I think we'll hear about that later on in other, uh, I think tomorrow probably we'll talk about it. Yeah, Ron. But how is this public key infrastructure different than just having an IP address? Why is having a public key different than having an IP address? I but because an IP address, I can just pretend. That's the point. I can say that my IP address is 57, and you can't check it. Right? With a public key, I can sign. That's the whole point. It, it enables doing it, right? If I can. We're back to the impossibility from your paper. <laughs> Sorry? <laughs> Now incentives, yeah. The, the, uh, so I wanted to keep away incentives here because we'll talk about it later on. All right, just to conclude, the fact that we don't know how many nodes there are that imposes the restriction that we need to deal with synchrony. We need to have a synchronous solution, uh, and um, the fact that we want to deal with late joining means we need honest majority. And now the controversial thing maybe is if we don't have any authentication mechanism. What I'm uh, arguing is we need to have a p protocol that's computationally uh, intensive, uh, because otherwise we have this uh, impossibility. Yeah? Um, how do you model the VRF in, in this context? How do I model the VRF thing? So uh, in this previous solution, uh, so in order to deal with adaptive corruption, we're using tricks similar to the VRF. Uh, this is kind of like, I'm running stronger crypto. It's kind of a mess here. You need to have an NIZK, sub-experiential uh, hardness, uh, and I guess. Uh, in the more abstract analysis. In what? In the, in the more abstract analysis. In the more abstract analysis, we can prove under sub-experiential security of NISICs and uh, that uh, you can implement some kind of f mine functionality. So that's I, I kind of a UC proof, again, as before. And once you have that, you can analyze everything abstractly again. So you kind of. You do the crypto as you do, and then you do the, the probability analysis later on in a clean model. What is CRS? Common reference string. So this is kind of like, it's not just enough to have a public infrastructure. You need to make sure that uh, um, you need to have, basically, there are various issues with this uh, VRF approach that make sure that you need to have some extra uh, randomness that's selected, uh, honestly. Okay. So. Uh, so the conclusion here is that if you want something in this setting, Nakamoto does it, which is great. Okay, and indeed, uh, it uses all these different uh, assumptions, and they're needed. And if you don't want proof of work, you can remove it, and you can still at least get the following the first two properties. So it's kind of a little bit permissionless. Uh, if you have a public key infrastructure, at least. And potentially, if you're happy with a proof of stake scheme, then maybe you can assume a public key infrastructure. But as I would argue, that doesn't, really doesn't give you full free entry, because it's only the people who have a stake in the system that can enter, and that has certain economic uh, consequences, that uh, they can kind of hold the system hostage. It's a little bit strange to call the to say that in Bitcoin you have free entry, yeah. it's a very expensive. It's not. <laughs> so so you, have to, you don't have a bound on the number of participants. <coughs> okay, it's not completely free today to buy this thing. I agree, uh, but in principle, yeah. you could have a scheme where uh, uh, you have something where you cannot use uh, these ASICs, uh, and then anybody who has a com computer can enter. So at least it has the potential of getting that. Yes. I didn't say that Nakamoto satisfies for uh, today, but at least anything that you know where you restrict to a, a group of people in the permission setting for sure does not have the free entry. So at least the Nakamoto thing maybe goes towards it, right? It's free as in freedom, not free as in cost us. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Potentially, right? Yes. yes. If you if you view this as freedom, the fact that you need to just invest a million dollars to buy your equipment. Oh, you you cannot, right? I cannot, personally, but maybe you can. That's capitalism. Yeah, well, you know, so we don't, we're not fully free yet, but. Yes, you're American, American. Yeah. Everyone can. So, so the point here, the conclusion is there are trade-offs, right? Uh, this thing burns the earth, but it gives us more freedom, maybe. But uh, so you have to decide where you want to be. 
on freedom versus uh, nature. Yeah. So we have time to stop here? Yeah. I have time to stop here, yes. <laughs>